Hello and welcome to Point of Science brought to you by the Durham team. We've got a great show for you this evening, but this is the only show we've got this year from Durham, so check out the rest of the programme for Wednesday and Thursday shows. So we've got two great speakers from Durham University, Professor Stefan Chaborski and Paula Chadwick, Professor Paula Chadwick. And in the halftime, I'm going to be talking to my teammate, Yaz, who's going to tell us about a science art project she's been working on. Before I forget, we've got a competition running with one of our sponsors of Point of Science. So check out the website. The link is in the chat. So we've only got the one show from Durham and hopefully we'll be getting some of our regulars in. But we're hoping that we'll get a few people who aren't from Durham. So let us know in the chat where you're coming from. Right. So first up, we've got Professor Stefan Chaborski. He is a professor of cell technology in the Department of Biosciences at Durham. Hi, Stefan. Hello, Lara, and good evening. So we're going to have about 15 minute chat from you, talk from you, and then please send in any questions that you've got. And we'll have a bit of a question and answer session between myself and Stefan afterwards. So I'll let Stefan do his talk first and then we'll catch up with you later. OK, thank you, Lara, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining today. So I'm going to be talking about building human tissues in the laboratory. So I'd like to, first of all, introduce you to cell culture technology. So this is uh, a science where we grow cells outside of the body. And in my laboratory, we grow human cells, what we call in, in an in vitro environment. So this is outside. Uh, the body, and we do so inside flat plastic dishes, as what you see here on the uh, on the screen. And this is known as two-dimensional cell culture. So 2D cell cultures have been around for many decades and have enabled uh, many important uh, scientific advances. They offer a reductionist, simplistic approach whereby scientists can ask uh, uh, simple questions and study mechanisms in the cells. However, the cell culture environment uh, in these dishes, as you can see in this slide, differs considerably from the complexities inside the body. Now, animal models uh, can provide a definitive test in a systemic, physiologically relevant environment inside the body of the animal. However, the conclusions from such studies do not always extrapolate to the human condition and what happens in man. And of course, there are obvious ethical and moral issues surrounding the use of animals. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the development of what we call advanced cell culture technologies that creates a new strategy for overcoming some of these limitations. So first, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of how cells adapt to a cell culture environment. So in the body, in vivo, cells reside in tissues, as seen in this colorful uh, image here. And they reside with other cells and create a three-dimensional complex uh, structure. But what happens in the laboratory in 2D culture, we pull these relationships apart and cells come into contact with the flat plastic dish and they flatten and they change shape. And you can see how this cell has become adapted to that environment compared to its native three-dimensional form. And when cells change shape, they change their function. So studying cells which are flattened like this does not necessarily represent how they truly behave. So we can generate technology to stop this process and shape change from occurring. So we develop technology to enable cells to grow in 3D so we can recreate a more three dimensional natural environment in the laboratory, which is more comparable to real tissue in vivo. And if we can do that, we can enhance cell viability, structure and function and create more representative models. And this has significant impact and uh, reach. So it can advance the research and discovery process in science, uh, the development of improved cell-based assays can also in, reduce uh, the time it takes uh, to get such discoveries and reduce the amount of money used. 
And also, if we're working in human systems, we can reduce and refine the use of animals in uh, such research. So it's important in many ways. So in Durham, we developed a material. It's a polystyrene scaffold, which enables three-dimensional cell growth in the laboratory. So if we look at this top line here, we see the two-dimensional uh, flat plates I mentioned to you, and the cells growing as flat monolayers in the bottom of the dish. Whereas if we change the geometry of the polystyrene and create this porous material, as I mentioned, we can now grow the cells in the vertical axis as well, the z-axis, and we can now create three-dimensional uh, cell cultures within our dishes using this membrane. This membrane is highly porous, as you can see from the bottom, bottom middle image, and cells enter and grow inside the scaffold and on its surface. So to really maximize the impact of this technology and to get it out into the scientific community, we commercialized uh, our research uh, through a Durham University spin-out company called Reinnovate where we developed methods to uh, manufacture and scale up uh, these uh, technologies. Uh, what you see uh, here in these images, this image is a, of a multi-well plate, and you can see these white disks. And this is the polystyrene scaffold. And we trademarked and termed that Alvatex scaffold. So Alvatex is the name of our product. And Alvatex is now uh, marketed uh, globally and is used throughout the world by scientists growing cells in three dimensions. Uh, we have uh, many, many different users. In fact, uh, Alvatex has also been to the space station where scientists have studied the effect of uh, zero gravity conditions on the growth of bone cells, for example. So the company and the product are developing very well. In fact, we sold Reinnovate to a larger company called Repercel, who continue to develop the technology. So let's see, does the technology work? So here we see uh, cells which have been uh, loaded up with a green fluorescent dye, and you can see them growing in conventional 2D cell culture. They're flattened. Whereas in the Alvatex technology, you can see that they are three-dimensional in shape. And if you look in this image, on the bottom right, you can see the three-dimensional profiles of cells very nicely using a method called scanning electron microscopy. So that's the basic cell culture technique, the 3D method I've introduced to you. But it goes beyond that. And I'm now going to talk to you about how we can use this technology to bioengineer human tissues in vitro. And this is a fundamental principle in anatomy and physiology where structure is related to function. And Leonardo da Vinci himself reported this in the late 1400s. And it is the strap line of one of our oldest learned societies uh, in our country, the Anatomical Society. And ex conformationis usus uh, means from structure comes function. So what this means is, is if we can get the structure of the cells and tissues correct in the dish, we will get improved functionality. So we're going to focus on how we can use the technology to bioengineer epithelial tissues on these Alvatex scaffold membranes. <clears throat> so an epithelium uh, often lines cavities in the body, uh, also uh, lines blood vessels, and also is obviously the outer uh, coating of our cells, the epidermis. In fact, the skin is the largest organ in the body, and it is an epithelium. And epithelia have different uh, structures and functions. So if you look at the bottom here, we've got some examples. So in the intestine, we have what is called a simple columnar epithelium. So these are a simple layer of cells, and they are designed for absorption and secretion of our food, for example. Whereas an oral mucosa inside the mouth has a stratified epithelium, so it's multiple layers, so it offers protection to abrasive forces. And our skin is also stratified, but it's keratinized, and that gives it waterproofing uh, characteristics. And again, it offers protection. So let's see how we can uh, use our technology to 
build uh, some of these tissues. So let's look at the structure of human skin. So we have here the epidermis on the surface, supported by the dermal compartment. So we use our polystyrene membrane as follows. So here's the membrane, and we seed in, into that membrane human dermal fibroblasts, and you can see them here, and they grow for 28 days. So this is what they look like after 28 days. So they've populated throughout the scaffold. The scaffold is essentially providing a three-dimensional support, and they also uh, grow on the surface. And this is an important time. So these fibroblasts, you can see a very nice example here on the right, they are very busy producing what we call the extracellular matrix. This is essentially is collagen. And these images on the left show nice green staining for that collagen inside that Alvatex membrane. So this is a human fibroblast producing human collagen. And that provides a foundation for building and supporting the epidermis. So this is the human full thickness skin model. So this is the dermal compartment, the Alvatex, with the fibroblasts and the collagen, and it supports the epidermis, which is this top uh, layer of cells here. And there are multiple layers as they divide and then they differentiate to the surface. And on the very top, you have these flaky cells, which are indeed the same cells of your human skin. So we now can increase the complexity of such models, and we can, for example, create pigmented full thickness skin model by introducing an important cell type called the melanocyte. So we see our skin models here. These are approximately uh, 1.2 centimeters in diameter, and that is the surface of the skin model. And you'll see the difference between the non-pigmented and pigmented, these ones have the melanocytes present. So the melanocytes are important cells in our body. They produce melanin, and melanin is transferred to other cells in the epidermis, the keratinocytes, and they produce a very nice, what we call a supranuclear cap up over the top of the nucleus. And it is understood that this arrangement is designed to protect the nucleus from the harmful effects of ultraviolet light. So it's like a little hat. So that's the real skin example. If we now look in our model of pigmented skin, you can see very nicely an example of a melanocyte. And all these little dots are the melanin uh, vesicles. And there's a very nice example here of a cap sitting above the nucleus. So this is a model that we've created. And we can now use these models to study, for example, how the melanocyte transfers the melanin uh, to these cells uh, to investigate basic uh, mechanisms in biology, but also to understand and develop uh, products by which we can see how this melanin cap uh, is protective and can work. We can also take melanoma cells which are cancerous uh, cells, and we can seed them into our human skin model, such as we see here. And then we can study their invasion into the underlying uh, dermal compartment. And we can use this as a model to study the spread of cancerous cells in healthy tissues. And we can then investigate the effect of anti-cancer drugs and treatments uh, using this uh, lab-based method. We can also simulate the aging process in human full thickness skin. So as we age, obviously our skin changes significantly. And as a result, we get a thinning of the epidermis and we lose collagen uh, in the dermal compartment. And we can simulate that process uh, in the laboratory and we can grow uh, a young skin model using uh, skin cells uh, from young donors, or we can obtain skin cells from older donors, and we can create an age skin model. And you can see very clearly the, dif the differences, for example, in the thickness of the uh, epidermis. 
So this can be very useful uh, in the development of uh, new skincare products, uh, which are designed to as interventions to stop this aging process or improve it uh, in, in skin. Of course, that's the cosmetic industry. So this model that we've produced is highly comparable to real human skin. And it is uh, generated using defined controlled conditions. The structure and function of these models are highly and extensively characterized, and they can be used in basic research and commercial applications, uh, as I've described. And we work very closely with Repressile still uh, and Procter and Gamble, who are interested in sponsoring this research for skin care product development. So we've produced other models in the laboratory too, but using the same concept, and that is building uh, on the Alvatex platform. So this is a human intestinal construct where we've taken intestinal fibroblasts and uh, intestinal or epithelial cells and we have constructed a model here so this is the in vitro cell culture model compared to the real tissue so we've reconstructed this intestinal uh, tissue and these models have demonstrated tissue-like function so they absorb and transport uh, molecules across the epithelium. And we've increased the complexities of the model by introducing uh, goblet cells. So these produce mucus, which we find in the intestine. And in this model at the bottom, all these uh, round dots, these are actually uh, immune cells. So these are cells uh, which are associated with inflammatory responses. And we can use this system to model inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And this is currently uh, being used uh, to investigate uh, mechanisms uh, in this pathology. Another model we have recently developed, and this is in collaboration with Repracel and AstraZeneca, is a model of the human nasal mucosa. So, this is the real nasal mucosa here on the right, and you can see nice ciliated cells on the surface, these little furry things. And we've been able to reproduce the structure of this uh, tissue in the laboratory, and we also find the ciliated cells on the surface. So this is the epithelium, and this is the supporting uh, fibroblast layer. So this is a highly specialized epithelium, um, and it is also a site uh, for the delivery of vaccines by nebulizers. So we are very interested in working uh, with uh, commercial partners uh, to develop uh, solutions whereby such in vitro models uh, can be used to study the deliver delivery of, say, the influenza uh, vaccine, and even possibly in the future, uh, COVID uh, vaccines as well. So this is an important application of this technology. And the last example I would like to share with you before I finish is a technology which was developed to replace and reduce animals in research. So you've probably all heard of uh, stem cells. So uh, stem cells, particularly embryonic stem cells, offer a significant uh, promise to uh, the future of uh, uh, medicine. They provide a renewable source of uh, differentiated cells. And when scientists test the ability of new uh, embryonic stem cell uh, lines to differentiate, they'll often create a what is called a teratoma xenograft. And this is where these cells are injected into mice and a tumor is produced. And you look inside the tumor and you can see all these human differentiated cells. So what we've done with our technology is to replace the use of the animal and to be able to achieve similar levels of cell differentiation uh, using our in vitro technology that I've described to you today using the Alvatex model. So what we see here, all these colorful images are of uh, these tumor cells, uh, sorry, tumor derived xenograft tissues, sorry, teratoma tissues uh, derived from the human embryonic stem cells. 
So for example, what we see here is a keratin pearl. These are, this is actually uh, skin. This is a piece of cartilage. This is primitive kidney over here. And this is primitive gut. And all of these human derived tissues are produced from these stem cells on the Alvatex platform, which enables us to replace the use of the animal. So we, in this assay, we have reduced technical burden, enhanced tissue development, greater controllability of the system, it's cost effective, and it can replace and reduce animals, as I say. So that's another very successful application of this technique. So last slide, in summary, we create technology to recreate the natural three-dimensional environment in the laboratory to simulate the growth of real human tissues. And it's clear from what I've shown that the environment in which cells grow can uh, have, play an important role in uh, the cell structure and function. So we can use the technology uh, to create uh, more sophisticated uh, ways to grow our cells and to produce human models as I have described. And this is a very rapidly advancing field of research. It allows us to increase the efficiency of the discovery process, uh, including the development of new pharmaceuticals. And of course, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we can develop alternatives to reduce the use of animals uh, in research. And I thank you for your attention. I'd also like to thank my laboratory and uh, collaborators for much of the work that I have presented this evening. Thank you. Brilliant. That was great, Stefan. And we've got a few questions now from the audience. So first question, how big can a tissue sample grow before it needs a blood supply? Okay, so that's an excellent question. Uh, because we don't have a vasculature in the system, we don't have a capillary bed. Um, so we deliberately produced our membranes which are 200 microns thick. So a cell in the middle of that membrane is 100 microns from the cell culture media. And on average, it is said that a cell in the body is no further than 100 microns away from a blood capillary. So that's one of the reasons why we made it 200. But um, if the membrane was too thick, then you would have uh, necrosis, for example, cells dying uh, in the middle of the scaffold. Now that could be detrimental, but actually it could also be beneficial because if you're wanting to model, say, the structure of a cancerous tissue, you often find areas of necrosis in such tissue. So it could be beneficial. It depends on what it is you're wanting to achieve. But to uh, mitigate that issue of uh, vasculature, we're now moving into perfusion models where we're moving the medium around the model as well to okay. improve its growth. Cool, and are you doing that at the moment in Durham? Yes, we uh, have built a benchtop bioreactor, as we call it, where we are uh, moving the medium around uh, a vessel, uh, around the surface of the uh, tissue model, and that breaks up what is called the unstirred layers, which mm -hmm. develop on the surface, and it promotes exchange of nutrients, oxygen, and waste products. So the tissue models have grow better. Brilliant. I think we've got a couple more questions at least. So let's go on with the next one. Okay, so Phil has seen many scenes in medical shows that use 3D printers to make tissues. Is that just sci-fi or is it a real possibility in the future? So 3D printers are essentially uh, sophisticated types of pipettes and they dispense cells into particular locations. And that is enables you to uh, create cellular arrangements and patterns uh, as a uh, beginnings of a tissue model. Mm -hmm. um, but there's more to it than that because it, it takes time for tissues to differentiate. So whilst 3D printers are, are great to initiate the process, you still have to have some differentiation time. Yep. And that is the reason why it takes, to make a skin model, it can take us six weeks uh, okay. to create a fully differentiated dermis and epidermis. But that's worth the wait because you end up with a very uh, decent model. Brilliant. I know that we had at least one more question. Yeah, okay, here's, uh, here's a slightly more technical one 
from somebody who I think knows what they're talking about. Looking at the nasal mucosa model, what would you say is the biggest advantage of this tech compared to the typical transwell model? So typical transwell models tend to just have a single layer of epithelial cells um, or a, uh, it could be a, a multiple uh, stratified layer or pseudo stratified layer. Um, what uh, we have, of course, is the addition of the fibroblasts and the tissue naturally and the, the epithelium uh, sits on what's called a basement membrane. Uh, and the basement membrane is produced by the epithelium interacting with the underlying uh, fibroblast stromal <laughs> cell layer. Uh, and it's much more tissue representative. And that's why you get the correct anatomy and physiology that we're seeing in our models compared to a transwell model, which tends to be more simplistic in nature. Cool. Um, we're running out of time slightly. So if there's one more question, otherwise I've got a question. Uh, why polystyrene, Stefan? Oh, I'll ask that one in a minute, but why polystyrene? <laughs> so very good question. Um, so we set out uh, designing this, working with and collaborating with uh, engineers and chemists in uh, Durham University. And polystyrene was selected uh, because it is currently an, an accepted cell culture plastic uh, substrate. And we wanted to demonstrate how changing the geometry of the same material that cells ordinarily grow on can result in significant changes in their behavior. So it works out as a really nice control. So you can compare the growth of cells in 2D and 3D culture with real tissue. And we've done that very nicely very recently with a, a liver cell project. And we were able to show that the 3D culture uh, gene expression profile was much more similar to real tissue expression profiles that rather than the 2D system. Brilliant. And I think there was one final question from the audience. So is there a degree of control for the pore sizes in the Alvatex? And is that important for different sized cells? Good question. And uh, we, when we developed the technology originally, we also looked at the size of the, the pores in the material. And we found that pore size affected their ability to grow in 3D uh, successfully. So we can control the pore size by the manufacturing process and method. Mm -hmm. And we settled on a pore size of around about 40 microns in diameter. So big enough for uh, many cells to crowd into, uh, but not all cells. I mean, myotubes for muscle are very long cells. They wouldn't go inside Alvatex. Uh, we would potentially grow them on the surface of Alvatex and, and use different qualities of the Alvatex uh, material for that purpose. In fact, the other thing I want to mention, uh, going back to the previous question, the other reason why it's uh, polystyrene yep. is because it doesn't degrade. And we didn't want a, uh, a product that changes during an experiment, because that would introduce yep. another variable. Mm -hmm. And also, because I always had an eye on commercialization, I wanted something which we could uh, ship and store and not have any issues in respect to uh, cold storage or degradation yeah. or shelf life or anything like that. So it makes a big difference. Yeah, makes absolute sense. Right, I think we're running out of time now for your talk. So thanks a lot. That was some great questions and a great talk, Stefan. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're now going to have a quick halftime show. So if you do need to run away, you could run away now if you've come here for Paula and not to talk to Yaz. So next I'm going to talk to my colleague Yaz about a side project that she's been doing. So hi, Yaz. Hello. So endosymbiotic love, what is this project that you've been working on? Um, so endosymbiotic love is essentially a collaboration between artists and scientists to embody a microorganism, well, 12 different microorganisms. Okay, so how did you meet the group of people that you've been doing this with? Um, it came about quite organically because we, um, we met up at a barbecue and um, the whole project just came about by us talking and sharing what we did as scientists and artists. 
and from there it came it kind of went into having really interesting um, discussions so um, discussions such as if we were microbes what would we be would we be bacteria that breaks down plastic or would we be you know a dangerous parasite that takes over insects um, so let us know what you'd be in the comments please um, but generally we wanted to um, explore the different relationships that we have with microbes around us and also the quite intimate um, relationships that um, scientists have with the microbes that we work with daily um, looking at them, um, how they move, what they look like, um, what they like, what they dislike, um, that kind of stuff. And also, um, we wanted to explore these relationships in a non-human centric way. So looking at these relationships from the microbes themselves, um, how they would see their lives and their different um, personalities from those that fight with us and those that kind of look after us. Um, so those conversations um, led into creating um, different artworks, um, which are the images and also the dating profiles, um, which are in the video forms um, that you can find on the website. Cool. So we're going to look at one of the videos now. So which video have we chosen? Um, so we've chosen um, cowpox um, and this has got Emmanuel, um, who is telling us about cowpox in a dating profile. Cool. And is it, Emmanuel's a scientist as opposed to one of your art collaborators, right? Yes. Yeah, so he's a scientist himself. Cool. So it is a collaboration between artists and scientists. Yeah. So yeah. each uh, microbe has got a scientist and um, and an artist working together. Um, Brilliant. Please. So we're just going to show you one of those examples. So Emmanuel talking about cowpox. So it's a one minute video and then we'll be back with you. You really need to know cowpox. She lives in a farm alone for a long time. It's a beautiful place. She likes walking in the path. She enjoys staying close to her fireplace in the evening. And she loves animals. Uh, so I hope you also like animals too. She has cows and horses. You really need to, to see them. She's looking for a long time relationship, you know. She would like to, to leave a mark that you will never forget, something intense. She wants to activate all your blood cells. This girl is so perfect that if it turns bad, she protects you from her heavy sister, smallpox. Her sister is a disaster, a catastrophe. But don't worry, you won't meet her. What you have to do now is to go to her farm. You meet her, you meet her cows. I promise you, you will be happy forever, really forever. Cool. I think quite a few of us can appreciate the countryside a bit more with a lot of other things that we couldn't have done in the last year. So, Yaz, what's next for you guys? Um, so with, with having such an amazing group of people together, we are going to stay as a collective and we've got um, our next project in the works um, and it's going to be about cholera in the UK. Cool. So if you want to check out the rest of the calendar, then it's all available on the website and have a look on Twitter and so on. So thanks a lot, Yaz. And we'll probably put, see you for a second later. But we're going to move on to our second speaker for the evening. So uh, we've had a few people say where they're from. So far, I've only seen people from the UK. So if anybody isn't from the UK, then give us a shout. Not that we don't appreciate you guys from near Norwich and Stirling. So first, I'm going to stop talking and let Paula chat in do her talk. So Professor Paula Chadwick, Professor of Astrophysics from the Department of Physics at Durham University. You're going to talk to us about gamma rays viewing the higher energy sky a billionth of a second at a time. Yeah, confused myself for a second there. So hi, Paula. Hello, hello, Lara. Hello, everybody. So once again, Paula's going to talk for about 15 minutes and then I will ask Paula any of your burning questions, including Paula's experience with wallabies. So OK. So I'll take it away. So as uh, Zara said, I'm going to talk about uh, gamma rays and specifically gamma ray astronomy, which is what I do for my research. 
Um, I'm going to explain a bit about what gamma rays are and how they are connected to particle accelerators in space. Um, then I'm going to talk about how you do gamma ray astronomy from space very briefly. And then I'm going to talk in more detail about how you do gamma ray astronomy from the ground. This is what I do, how it works, what we've built so far, um, and the uh, experiment I'm currently trying to build um, called the Cherenkov Telescope Array. So, <clears throat> a familiar picture, I think, to lots of you, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we're all used to light, uh, which sits in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. At longer wavelengths um, and therefore lower energy off to the left of this picture, um, you see things like uh, infrared, that's what you feel when you stand next to a radiator, microwaves that cook your tea, um, and radio, of course, that uh, provide us with radio stations, of course. Off to the right hand side, you see stuff of shorter wavelength that is much more energetic and therefore has a tendency to be damaging. So we have things like ultraviolet, which, of course, can give you sunburn as well as producing useful vitamins in your skin. X-rays, which can be useful in medical sense, but too much of which is a problem. And then gamma rays, which are the most energetic form of radiation. They do have some uses in medicine for cancer treatment, um, but in general, they're not something you want to encounter too often. Now, in fact, most astronomers use the electromagnetic spectrum to try and understand the universe. This is where we get most of our information from. These pictures show you the sky at different wavelengths. Um, the, the bright band across the middle is actually the plane of our galaxy. So most things kind of glow because they're warmer than their surroundings, because the heat has caused the particles or whatever uh, within those systems to move about and, and emit radiation. So the top left, left there, you can see infrared. Uh, things that produce infrared radiation tend to be a few tens of degrees. Then optical tends to be a few thousand degrees. Think of the sun. That's about 6,000 degrees on its surface. Ultraviolet, a few tens of thousands of degrees. And then x-rays and objects that produce x-rays tend to be a few million degrees in terms of temperature. But it turns out that not everything can come from stuff that's somehow warm. At the low energy, long wavelength end of the spectrum, we think about radio waves. and We can work out easily what temperature you need something to be to create radio waves. And it turns out that they would be colder than the background temperature of the universe, about minus 300 degrees centigrade. And at the other end of the spectrum, the one I'm interested in, the gamma rays would need to be produced at absolutely enormous temperatures, indeed considerably hotter than, well, anything since the Big Bang. These kinds of things we can't produce from what's known as thermal radiation. We have to produce them a different way. And the way that we do it is to accelerate the particles directly using things like shot waves from explosions and magnetic fields. So what this tells us is that there's a whole bunch of particle accelerators much more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider that exists in the universe. This is a picture of the Atlas detector, by the way. What's more, actually, we do get to see some of the particles that have been accelerated. These are called cosmic rays. I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, but it so happens that when these are being accelerated to extreme energies, we also create the gamma rays that I'm interested in. So we've got these extremely energetic radiations. Um, is it death from space? Um, well, a plus um, as far as life on Earth is concerned is that gamma rays don't actually penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. For an astronomer, this is a bit of a nuisance, to be honest. Added to all this, you can't focus gamma rays. They just go through things instead of bouncing off them. And also gamma rays are rare. So from an astronomer's perspective, they're very difficult to work with, albeit very interesting. But an obvious thing to do is to get your telescope above the Earth's atmosphere. And um, we have one in operation at the moment. It's called the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Um, you can see a sort of artist's impression there on the, the left hand side. Um, and it's named after Enrico Fermi who uh, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1938 and who did a lot of work on the acceleration of particles and how we do it. I was surprised, actually, when I was doing the slide to realise how young he was when he died, actually. Uh, I like this little quote of his from the bottom. Before I came here, I was confused about this subject. Having listened to your lecture, I am still confused, but on a higher level. So I hope we're not going to be in that state by the end of this little talk. Now, if I put my telescope in space, get some limitations. So this is a picture of a typical uh, telescope to detect gamma rays that you might put in space. 
So what happens is we have a gamma ray that comes in at the top there um, and somewhere in the system it creates an electron and it's positively charged twin, a positron. And we can track where those are going and therefore work out where the gamma rays come from. But this detector is in fact rather small. It's only about one square metre across. Now, I'm interested in these really rare and very energetic events. So in order to catch enough of them to do some science, I need something that's quite a bit bigger. In fact, I need something that's the size of your average football ground, plus the stands and probably including the car park as well. You're not going to launch that in a hurry. Um, you start to block out the sun apart from anything else. So we need a different approach. Well, science helps us here. Um, there's something called Cherenkov light, which is very useful. Cherenkov light is a kind of radiation that's produced when a charged particle exceeds the velocity of light in a medium. Now, when I can see an audience, usually I can see a few puzzled expressions at this point. You're always told nothing goes faster than the speed of light. And this is indeed true. But we tend to be a bit sloppy. What we should really say is nothing goes faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. When light has to go through something, whether that's air or water or lemon jelly, it slows down a bit. And so it's possible for something to go faster than light can go through the medium, but not faster than light can go through a vacuum. So we don't break any laws of physics. This drink of light effect is, is rather similar to a speedboat which produces a wake on water when it's going faster than the waves on the water so the waves can't get away, or when a jet fighter breaks the sonic barrier um, and the sound waves can't get away and you get the shockwave, the, the sonic boom as it's known. You can see Cherenkov radiation in nuclear reactor cores. It's a rather nice shade of blue. Um, and so here's a picture of a nuclear reactor core surrounded by water. And you can see this blue Cherenkov light, uh, which is caused by charged particles in the water surrounding the nuclear reactor. Well, it so happens that very high energy gamma rays produce cascades of energetic charged particles in the atmosphere. And because the gamma ray is very energetic, these particles are moving faster than the speed of light in air. And so they produce Cherenkov light. I'm often asked, can you see it with the naked eye? Uh, unfortunately, you can't. First of all, it's very faint. It constitutes about one ten thousandth of the total starlight. And secondly, because of the way the particles arrive, which is kind of all at once, the pulses produced are really short. They are a few billionths of a second. Now, people have, have actually seen Cherenkov light in their eyes, and these were the astronauts on board the Skylab space station. Um, and they noticed little flashes of blue um, in their eyes when they shut their eyes. And this was actually Cherenkov light produced by energetic particles from the sun in the vitreous humour of their eyeballs. Um, but as far as I know, that's the only real way you can see Cherenkov light directly with your eyes. This is actually the first ever ground based gamma ray telescope, which is designed to catch this Cherenkov light in the atmosphere. It was built in 1953 um, by John Jelly and Bill Galbraith at Harwell in Oxfordshire. Um, so it's a British telescope. Now, although things, as I hope you're about to find out, have got more sophisticated, um, basics are much the same. So we still want the biggest mirror we can lay our hands on. They bought theirs down Tottenham Court Road. Um, it was an army surplus uh, searchlight mirror. We want a really high speed light detector. We use something called a photomultiplier tube, which actually we still use today because they are extremely fast. Um, and you also want an amplifier plus electronics um, in order to process the signal that you get from your light detector. It might look, by the way, like this is sitting inside a dustbin. That's because it is sitting inside a dustbin. And um, they put the whole kit inside an army surplus searchlight uh, uh, and inside a, a government issue a dustbin. We've got a bit more sophisticated, as I said. So what we now do is something called the imaging atmospheric Cherenkov technique. So our gamma ray comes into the upper atmosphere, creates this cone of Cherenkov light, which hits a telescope at the bottom. The telescope is equipped with many individual detectors, which we put in an array, and it typically sees something that looks a bit like an ellipse, as you can see in this picture. Now, the nice thing is that the long axis of the ellipse follows direction that the gamma ray came from. Um, so 
we can work out where the gamma ray might have come from. But as you can probably see on that picture, the gamma ray could have come from anywhere along the dotted line. So what we actually do is we put many telescopes into the Cherenko flight, we get lots of images, and then we can triangulate on where the gamma ray came from. What that gives us is a really huge collecting area. It gives us that couple of football pitches area because the light pool on the ground that we get is about 10,000 square meters. And actually we can also get better angular resolution. We can take more precise pictures than any space-based instrument is capable of doing. We've done this. Um, there are various telescope systems around the world. There's Veritas here in Arizona, uh, Magic on La Palma in the Canary Islands, and uh, also the Hess telescopes um, in Namibia in Southwest Africa. So we know how to do this. <clears throat> it's very successful. What do we see? We see some extraordinary objects. We see jets of matter squirting out of black holes at uh, close to the speed of light. We see bursts of gamma rays from things like colliding neutron stars and extreme supernova events, also known as hypernovae. Um, we get gamma rays from the rapidly rotating remains of dead stars called pulsars. And we also see them from the shock waves left behind by old supernova explosions and many other things as well. What we know is that we're seeing kind of the tips of, of icebergs. We see a few of the brightest ones of each of this type of object. and We know there must be more if only we had a better telescope. So, funnily enough, that's what we're doing. We're building something called the Cherenkov Telescope Array at the moment. Um, and as you can see from the picture, um, the array of telescopes, and we hope there might be as many as 150 in total ultimately, consists of telescopes of lots of different sizes. So if you look on the right there, you can see a really big telescope that's about uh, 23 meters in diameter called the large size telescopes. Um, and uh, this looks a lot like the original telescope you saw. It's got a very big mirror and it's got a light detector at the focus of the mirror. And this is designed to pick up the lower energy range of the gamma rays that we can see. Um, these are very faint. They don't produce much light in the atmosphere, so we need a big mirror. Then you can see a couple of telescopes in the middle. These are our medium sized telescopes. Um, and the leftmost of them is in fact a rather interesting design with, with two mirrors. And uh, these are designed to do all the hard work in the middle of our energy range. And then right on the left hand side, you can see a small size telescope. Now, even the small telescopes have got a main mirror that's four meters in diameter. So not that small. And um, they also work on a two mirror system um, with a little camera between the mirrors. So it's a big collaboration. 1500 scientists, 31 countries and two arrays, one in the northern hemisphere, one in the south. So we get to see the whole sky. What we're helping to build in Durham um, is the cameras for the small size telescopes. Um, there's no scale on here. It's, a, it's sort of a 40 centimeter cube. Um, and we're going to need to make at least 40 of them in the first instance and uh, perhaps ultimately as many as seven. And, uh, you can see on the surface there are all these little squares. These are the latest kinds of silicon light detector called silicon photomultipliers, which bear actually very little relation to the original things that Galbraith and Jelly used. We need a telescope to put our um, camera on. Um, we've got a prototype. Um, the prototype is halfway up Mount Etna, uh, which might seem a slightly odd place to put a telescope, but there has been an observatory there for about 140 years, if memory serves. Um, and uh, we are reliably informed that it has never yet been overwhelmed by lava. So we're reasonably confident that all will be well on that front. So we put the camera on the telescope in 2019, November, just before the snow started to fall on Mount Etna. And uh, greatly to our pleasure, as you can see from the little picture, uh, we showed that, in fact, it works. Um, of course, we've now had a pandemic, and um, so we haven't yet been back to Mount Etna, um, but we're hoping to go as soon as we possibly can. Um, and we're now working on the final versions of the cameras so that we can go fully into production mode for the array. It's going to be a bit of a challenge, but interesting. If you'd like to keep up with what CTA does, we have lots of presences all over the place. We've obviously got a website. Uh, we do Twitter, we do Facebook, um, we do YouTube, um, where there are various films, we do Instagram. There's also a series of lectures designed for the general public, um, which you can join if you would like to. I think you can find out about those from the website. And that just about wraps it up for me. Thank you very much um, for listening. Thanks, Paula. And I think we can put some of those links up if people want to check out the CTA website, etc. So I've got a few questions for you. Okay. Um, yeah. There we go. Hello. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> so 
Mount Etna, Namibia, how do you choose the places for these observatories and for these telescopes? Oh, great question. Okay. So the first thing we want is not too many lights. Mm -hmm. um, lights are a bit of a disaster. Um, our detectors are really, really sensitive. Second thing is we don't want too many clouds because um, actually the Cherenkov light um, is developed above the clouds. It's about 10 kilometers above sea level. So clouds get in the way. So we don't want clouds. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to be reasonably high because although the atmosphere is part of our detector, we don't want so much of it that it starts to absorb the Cherenkov light. Yeah. So a sweet spot for us is about two kilometers above sea level. Cool. Um, and the final thing we'd actually like is if somebody's already laid some electricity beforehand. Right. <laughs> it's a right so, pain laying your electric cables. <laughs> brilliant. So um, does the kind of the temperature or the condi the weather conditions of the, the place have an effect or are your cameras and things resilient enough to survive in pretty much anywhere on Earth? We try and make them so that they can survive. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with these cameras is that the, the face plate that all, that all the little mm -hmm. detectors go in is actually water cooled oh, um, in order to keep that cool. We've got all sorts of cooling systems inside the camera to make sure it stays at the right temperature. Otherwise, it gets quite hot inside that box, actually. Um, mm -hmm. you, there was even a research project to decide what color one ought to paint telescopes. And it turns out that red is really good um, because it doesn't get as hot as black would during the day. But also it doesn't reflect too much of the blue Cherenkov light. So it doesn't interfere with our pictures. Yeah. We, we cool. think about all these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, CTA, so you're making the, the cameras at the moment. When are you aiming for CTA to be finished? Oh, well, now then, that's a very good good question. So we've got something called phase one. Um, so we get the initial funding, you know, from mm -hmm. around the world. And we say, okay, we, we can get going. We'd like a bit more yet. Um, so we were, we're hoping that we start to get the telescopes on the ground in the southern array in um 2022 right okay. and then there's something like a two three year construction depending on how things go and pandemics and so on of course like everybody we're a little bit behind um in fact the first telescope's already on site for the northern array because it's our prototype large telescope but these telescopes are so large there'll only be four of them you don't bother building a prototype you just build your first one yeah, <laughs> yeah. hope it works <laughs> yeah Cool. I think somebody in the audience has now put a question up. So what is the most interesting discovery space object or phenomenon made with Cherenkov light so far? Oh, wow. Gosh, Anna, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think probably I think probably it's it's learning about these active galaxies, these things with these extreme jets. They're going very close to the speed of light. And first of all, we didn't know they produced gamma rays at all um, until we took a look at them, um, not at the sorts of energies we deal with. And secondly, we've seen really rapid variability in them. And when you consider these are vast objects, to see them varying on timescales of a matter of seconds is quite extraordinary. Um, and trying to understand what happens inside those jets is uh, one of the things that we would like to do. Cool. So would you say they're your favourite objects? Uh, or do you I'm very fond of binary stars, actually. Um, but that's because they're cussed. Um, but yeah, probably. <laughs> Cool. I think somebody else had a question. Yeah. Uh, what are the main sources of cosmological gamma rays? OK, so those active galaxies I talked about, um, the pulsars and the pulsar wind nebulae around them, they tend to dominate inside our galaxy. Shot waves from supernovae. Um, what else we've got? We've got binary star systems. Um, we've got these gamma ray bursts, which are the colliding neutron stars or the hypernovae. Um, but actually, something like a third of the objects that we see, we haven't identified. We don't know what they are. They don't seem to have any counterparts at other wavelengths. So that's another little mystery that we'd like to solve with, with CTA because it will have better angular resolution. We'll be able to pinpoint a bit better what some of these things are. There's, cool. a, there's a lot to understand. Yeah, always more to look at. And I think there's one last question from the audience. Oh, OK. Um, so... Um, the reason it's blue is actually because the blue dominates. Um, so um, it's because of the way the refractive index of air changes with wavelength, actually. Um, and blue, in fact, dominates. It's a bit like why the sky is blue in, in some sense, except that's scattering. Anyway, um, so we do get other wavelengths, but the blue is the really dominant wavelength. Um, and the great question you always ask PhD students, actually, is why don't you get x-rays? Because you get more energy the shorter the wavelength you go to in Cherenkov light. And the answer is that uh, you don't 
the, the refractive index of air in x-rays is less than one so you don't see x-rays um we get about as blue as we can um before we give up there's a very long equation called the frank tam equation which uh, you can look up if you want to yeah we won't put it in the chat this evening you guys no, have to no, no. i can't remember it apart from anything else <laughs> oh so very final question why are there so many telescopes called things like the large telescope the very large telescope <laughs> lack of imagination on the part of astronomers <laughs> there's there's a little bit of a tradition actually which mm -hmm. is that you don't name instruments or satellites um actually until they got going successfully the last thing you want is to name a satellite for example particularly after a person only for it to fall out of the sky in a fireball um so that you usually happen. wait until you've got your project you know on the ground or off the ground um so for instance the large synoptic survey telescope is now named the vera rubin observatory um so oh. you, you tend to wait a bit. they do get names eventually they, they they often do i mean in our case it'd probably still be called the Cherenko telescope right because we've got so many telescopes but i have in mind ultimately a sort of competition to get um kids from the local schools local to where we're putting the telescopes um to to name each individual telescope but which i think could be quite fun that might be really nice. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And hopefully it won't end up like the boat. <laughs> uh, no, no. Well, we can only have one telescope, telescope face, can't we? Yeah. So you've still got a few others to name if that yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So thanks again, Paula. Hopefully we've, I think we've answered yeah. all the questions from the audience. So I'll thank you again and let you go. So that is basically the end of our show, guys. I hope we've answered most of your questions. There is a feedback form in YouTube underneath the video. So if you can do the feedback form, there's another competition prize draw that you can enter, I think. Um, that is separate to the competition we mentioned earlier, which is to do with one of our sponsors, and you can get little fuzzy bees. Okay, so I think it's about time for me to do the, the goodbye. Uh, so thanks again to our two speakers, Paula and Stefan. And finally, I want to thank the rest of the Durham team who will say bye to you in a second. So it's bye from me and bye from the rest of the team. We've got Ruth. Hello. Dario. Bye. And Lucy. Bye. Tessa. And Yaz. Bye, everyone. Bye.